I need to, I need to report this. <laughs> Go. No, Now, guys, I can't talk. I'm using a power tool. Hey, can we go use the saw to make a paper football? Permission denied. No. Here we are at the drill presses. Uh, the drill presses can be kind of dangerous, so let's take a look at some drilling procedures. First of all, if you're going to drill a small piece on the drill press, you don't want to hold this in your fingers because if you hold this in your fingers and you start drilling this uh, and the drill bit catches that piece, it'll start spinning like a little propeller and it can spin several hundred RPM and that's fast enough for those uh, square corners to become very sharp and start cutting your fingers. What you want to do is you want to clamp this little piece in some way. Uh, some drill presses have a clamping assembly built in. Um, I always make sure that there is a set of of channel locks right here at the drill press so that you can clamp onto that piece with a pair of channel locks so you're not risking cutting your fingers. And then uh, you turn it on right up here and drill your hole. Don't have to risk cutting your fingers. If you're going to drill a larger piece, say we're going to drill a hole in this large piece right here. Um, what I always re recommend to people to do is there's a vertical shaft back here at the back of the drill press. I always recommend that people put that piece, that larger piece, against the left hand side of the vertical shaft. That way if the drill bit catches, it can't spin any further. If you put it on the wrong side, it can swing around and hit like that and bust a bit. So we'll put this against the left hand side and drill our hole like so. Nice safe procedure. Who wants to drill a special hole, they get permission to make something special in the shop and they want to drill something that's larger uh, than or smaller than what we have over on the dedicated tools. So this one we have a chuck key right here on the drill press that you can change the drill bits with. Uh, to change a drill bit we put the chuck key inside one of these little holes See, there are three holes around here. We put the chuck key inside one of those holes and we use it like a wrench. And we can open up the chuck. This is the chuck. This is the chuck key. We open up the chuck and we take the drill bit and put the drill bit up inside the chuck. And then we take our chuck key again and we tighten that up. And we want to make it nice and tight. And you can get it extra tight if you go once on all three of the holes. And it'll get it extra tight, just like that. Now, whenever you're done using the chuck key, it's very important to remove the chuck key from the chuck and set it back here out of the way. If you leave the chuck key in the chuck and the next person comes and turns it on, that could start spinning around, uh, snap that chain or something, or if there isn't a chain on the chuck key, uh, that could throw that out of the chuck. It could hit someone in the stomach or some of you shorter kids, it could hit you in the throat. So make sure that chuck key is taken out and set aside. Um, this particular drill press, we're, gonna, we're drilling with a bigger hole here. We're drilling a thicker piece of wood. And this particular drill press also has its own built-in clamping assembly. 
So we can bring this over, bring it down, and we can clamp that like so. Okay, nice and tight. That wood isn't going to go anywhere. Now, when we drill a bigger hole, it's a good idea to go down in, in um, work your way through. Don't go all the way through in one shot. So a couple of uh, oscillating spindle sanders, and uh, the interesting thing about those, if you take a look at the shaft here, when you turn on the spindle sander, it goes up and down. The up and down motion is to keep the uh, sanding drum from wearing out in one spot. It kind of spreads the wear over a larger area. Uh, one very important thing you need to remember about any of the sanders in the shop is that they will harm your knuckles and your fingernails. If you accidentally bump your knuckles against that spinning shaft, you'll draw blood right away. And if you bump your fingernails against that spinning shaft, you'll rip those fingernails right down to the cuticle in no time. So keep the knuckles and fingernails away from these sanding surfaces. Let's also take a look at the uh, disc sander. Here's our disc sander. It's a round wheel with a round piece of sandpaper glued onto it. And if we turn it on down here, it'll spin in this direction. It's kind of loud, so let's turn it off while I'm talking. Uh, one very important thing about sanding on the disc sander, and that is that all the sanding on the disc sander should be done on the left-hand side. Don't sand over on the other side, because if you sand on the other side, this is going to shoot um, sawdust up into the air, it's going to fill the whole room with sawdust, which is actually a, a, a fire hazard. So do your sanding down here, the sawdust will go down, and the ventilation system, the dust collection system, will suck that sawdust out of the machine if you use the left side only. Here we have the wide belt sander. This is a six inch wide belt sander, and as with the other sanders, this can also harm your fingernails and knuckles. So, so as you're working, keep your fingers back away from the belt while you're working on this table. Don't get those fingernails close to it. Don't get those knuckles close to it. You'll be drawing blood really fast. Um, and uh, work slowly around this. It'll remove material on the wood quite quickly. Here's the machine that uh, I'm afraid to say we get the most injuries on. Uh, we do get a few nicked thumbs and a few nicked fingers a year on the bandsaw. And uh, for safe operation of the bandsaw, there are about four different things you want to do. Number one, try to keep your fingers about two inches away from the blade. Here's the blade right here. And as you're working on the bandsaw, try to hold your piece back further away from the blade. Don't, don't be right in close to the blade like this hold back here. Stay away from the blade. Uh, number two, for, for cutting different thicknesses of material, um, there is an adjustment on the back side and what we want to do is we want to loosen the triangular nut and turn the wheel and we can adjust right down nice and thin for something thin like our desk jockey plastic. Lock the nut back up again. Or if we're working on a CO2 car, we can run it back up to the right thickness so that CO2 car will go underneath there and we can make all of our cuts. This keeps the blade from wandering too much, keeps the blade more stable and keeps it from um, popping off the wheels too often. Uh, another thing that you want to do, uh, some kids come up with some zigzag designs and uh, say they want to cut a zigzag in here. What they have to do is they have to make one cut in, back out of the cut slowly, make the next cut, and the part drops out, then make the next cut, back out slowly, make the next cut, the part drops out. When you're backing out of a cut like that, especially when you're doing a zigzag, back out slowly. If you back out slowly, there's less of a chance of pulling the bandsaw blade off of the pulley wheels that are inside here. Uh, the thing that happens when, when the bandsaw blade is pulled off the pulley wheels is it's a very startling noise and it could uh, shock someone into moving into a bad place with their fingers or something. So pull out of cut slowly if you have to pull out of a cut. Uh, another thing is if you have to make um, a cut and you're getting to the end of the cut, this is a, a bad mistake people make. They get to the end of their cut and, and they have their fingers, they're pushing like this. Look at that. That's going to cut right into my thumb making that kind of a cut. Um, get a, a scrap piece out of the waste basket and use that scrap piece as a push stick as you're making that final cut through there. And then if you cut anything, you'll cut that scrap piece and not your finger. 
One thing important about working in a shop is turning equipment on and turning equipment off. And a couple rules you need to remember. Number one, anyone can turn a machine off. There may be an emergency situation where the operator of the machine has been injured and can't think clearly enough to turn the machine off, but someone nearby can, is still thinking quickly and they can turn a machine off. So again, anyone can turn a machine off. Uh, the other side of this rule is only the operator of the machine should turn the machine on. And, and if you don't, uh, if you have someone else turn a machine on for you because you're holding some wood in a certain position or something, uh, you're going to find that you're not going to be in a position to turn that machine off in a hurry. So only the operator should turn the machine on. Um, another thing about uh, machinery is always the first thing that you should learn about a piece of equipment is how to turn it off. That's the most important thing to learn about a piece of equipment. Um, if you turn a piece of equipment on and uh, you suddenly find that you're in trouble, if you didn't learn how to turn it off before you turned it on, you may find yourself being injured. Um, also, you'll notice that we do have a number of different types of switches in the shop, and usually they're indicated by a green button to turn the switch on and a red button to turn the switch off. Frequently that's what we'll find. Green to turn it on, red to turn it off. All of the machines in this shop generate a lot of dust and airborne dust is a fire hazard and in order to cut down that fire hazard we have a dust collection system that's connected to most of the machines in the shop. You'll see behind uh, the band saws and the oscillating spindle sanders there's a clear tube that connects all these machines together and uh, if you want to use a machine there are also some yellow gates which you can open when you use a machine and that will connect this machine to this tubing that's uh, running behind them. Then if you go over, you can go up and you can see the tubing goes up and enters a large uh, structure of blue pipes. And these blue pipes are also connected to other machines in the shop. And everything goes outside and is connected to a giant vacuum cleaner outside. And that giant... Hi, welcome to Tech Ed. Now Tech Ed at West Sylvan can be one of the most fun classes, but can also be a little dangerous because of all the power tools. However, if you can work effectively, Tech Ed can be one of the most amazing classes you'll ever take. So I'm going to show you what you should do and what not to do in Tech Ed. Rule number one, know what you're doing. In other words, stay on task. The first thing you need to do is log in as a technology student. You just click on the symbol next to technology. There is no password required. The second thing you need to do is look for the Tech Ed How To Videos folder on the desktop. Double click that and all the videos will show up. If you want to search a video, search it in the search bar. For example, Birdhouse. Your vid video will show up. You just have to double click it and make it full screen right there and then play it. Make sure that you watch a lesson plan whenever you do a project. You don't want to end up like Homer Simpson here. Oh, come here, get, uh, come on, fit you. I mean, you, just, you, get, uh, uh, you. Uh. Yeah, that's one fine-looking barbecue pit. Why doesn't mine look like that? Rule number two: eye protection. Can I get some eye protection? Oh yeah, sure. Here you go. Thank you. Okay, you see, I just gave Joe some eye protection. Now you want to wear eye protection every time you go into a workshop because unexpected things may occur, like this. <laughs> Rule number three, never enter a restricted area unless you have permission. Okay, now in Tech Ed, there are four restricted areas. Mr. Gilly's workstation, Mr. Gilly's office, the checkout counter, which is allowed for TAs only, and Mr. Gilly's personal area in the workshop. Now, the reason you can't enter these areas is because they are restricted. They're allowed only for Mr. Gilly and sometimes TAs. When in doubt, make sure you look at the yellow tape by these restricted areas. Therefore, you know where to go and where not to go. Rule number four, be safe. Whether in the workshop or not, Tech Ed is always the place where you should be safe. 
To be safe means that you're being responsible. And if you're responsible, then you can participate actively. Here are some examples of what you should not do. Running. Jumping over somebody. Tech ad is always a place where you should keep your hands to yourself. Don't punch, touch, or push anybody anywhere. Please don't throw random objects at anyone. Do not use a tool unsafely, inappropriately, or without permission. In other words, don't hammer in a nail with a screwdriver. And never sit on one of the tables in Tech Ed. You could break one of the table legs and the table could collapse. Rule number five, always report an injury to the teacher. When you get hurt, report an injury to the teacher so we can provide medical attention. Hey, Joe! Hey, Joe! I dare you to touch that for, for five seconds. I'll give you a quarter. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Okay, do it. Oh! Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh! Ah, ah. Rule number six: Use computers for proper use only if obligated. Hey, what are you doing? What's these videos, bro? What are you doing? What are you doing? Get out of here! Get out of here! Rule number seven, pay attention to your tool and wait by it after you turn it off. When using a tool in the workshop, focus at the task at hand. Make sure you pay attention because you don't want to slip or anything because you could hurt yourself really badly on one of those power tools. You want to focus and make sure that your hand is nowhere near the blade or the sander or the drill bit or whatever you're using because you always want to be safe in tech ed. Okay, so you want to make sure when you're using a power tool for whatever project you're doing, you want to turn it off as soon as you're finished using it. Turn it off and then wait by it until it stops moving. This is because uh, someone could back into it or they could touch it on accident. It's happened in the past so we don't want it to happen again. Rule number eight, always clean up after yourself. At the end of every single day, there's going to be a cleanup time. Now during cleanup time, there are normally six or seven different steps that you need to follow. And by steps, I mean jobs. You'll be assigned with one of each. Rule number nine, no food or drink with the exception of bottled water. There's one last rule in Tech Ed, and that rule is no eating or drinking, except for bottled water, because we don't want it to spill anywhere or get smeared on any piece of equipment. You don't want to be this kind of person. Mm. Hey, bro! Hey, bro! No! No! Make sure you remember that if you disobey any of these rules, you'll get in... BIG TROUBLE! Thank you for watching. I hope you found these rules informative. Please do your best to act safely in technology education. Thanks. Starring Kai Helberg, Joe Kortenhoff, Mason Dawes, and Tate Coors.